So welcome everyone, my name is Kevin, I'm your presenter today. We're gonna to focus on the MMI preparation and the interview day, because we provide presentations on a lot of topics. Uh, so if you're interested in anything else, just let us know, we might be able to send you a recording. And about me, well, I'm a medical student at the Mayo Clinic in the United States, but I applied to medical school twice. I applied only Canada the first year, and I got two interviews, two interviews, and I did not get in. So I applied again the next time, and I got nine interviews. Uh, I think it was four in Canada, five in the US, uh, across different provinces, and I've done six MMIs total. So I've seen every kind of MMI there is to see, and the focus of this presentation is really the difference between great answers and extraordinary answers, okay? And you'll see what I mean soon. So the format is a modified MMI with UBC. And it's specific, of course, to British Columbia issues. And it's synchronous. So this can be contrasted with what recently came out, the Manitoba interview. And that was not... I mean, that's like Kira talent. That's like your Casper, you record something. But here you see someone in front of you. And I believe this year, because it, it's changed, you know, they're changing things all the time. Uh, it's a prompt. You have two minutes to read the prompt, three minutes to answer. And then there's a five minute follow up period where you can be asked, you know, questions uh, in a less maybe structured manner. And note that I'm, I'm talking about the MI here. I'm not talking about the indigenous panels or, or any of those panels. And there's 10 stations total, but I'm not gonna bore you with that. I'm sure you know that. A lot of them are important topics to know, okay? So this is a very important list of topics that I, if I were you, I would be researching. Now again, to everyone who just joined, I will be sending you these slides after the presentation. So don't bother taking notes, just get yourself comfy. But there's things that are especially important, you know, in Vancouver, where the main campus is, but maybe you're applying to different campuses. Um, that you should know about, like the opioid epidemic, homelessness, barriers to care. Uh, but here's the thing, a lot of people focus on this list. This is like a very, you know, a very apparent list, obvious list. You know, I, sh I should probably research these. But what did it for me, because remember, I applied two times, and the first year I did not get in, but the second year I got into many places, was thinking like, okay, let me not just like look at medicine, or public health, but let me go like several shells beyond that. Let's look at the housing crisis in BC. What about climate change and wildfires? Like, did you know that climate change, because it, it melts the snow, obviously, uh, it affects like the identity of certain indigenous peoples, you know, could that, that really, you know, identify with their nature? Like, I did not know this, but the second year I really started researching like several layers Oh wait, we have a doctor shortage. What international medical graduate policies are going on right now? We have neurosurgeons coming from Asia who are working in Ubers, right? Because they can't get licensed here. They have to like redo uh, everything. Do we have, you know, what's going on in terms of policy? Mid-level providers. So for example, in Ontario, pharmacists can now prescribe things. Can BC uh, have similar things? Even stuff like, cancel culture, the wealth gap, AI and healthcare, aging population. These are things, and remember, th this is like a really cool list of topics that I just wrote down based on everything I researched. So I will send you this, um, and I would really recommend spending time with this list. And previous years, every year is you know, a bit different, but if there was a heavy emphasis on like indigenous health, uh, drug addiction, mental health, racism, DEI, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, the LGBTQ, and, and their healthcare, you know, they have specific healthcare needs. And also there's like sometimes quote questions. It's like they give you a quote and then they ask you about it. It might not even have anything to do with healthcare. So that's what it means, it may not be relevant to healthcare. And you might even have like a weird question, like is war good or bad? So this is like really timely with all the wars going on and all the imminent wars. Did you know there's a lot of imminent wars um, in the world? So understanding things about the world uh, will set you apart in your answers. So the way I think is, is the best learning way is always to practice. So that's how I structure this presentation. We're gonna practice together, okay? So let's do this question together. Imagine you're a physician and you encounter a patient with chronic pain who requests opioid medication. How would you balance the need for effective pain management with the risk of opioid addiction, all right? 
And I'm going to give you guys, you guys, gals, whatever, I'm going to give you a great answer. So first you look at this question, you're like, okay, here's how I'm going to answer it. I'm going to say I would conduct a comprehensive assessment of the patient's pain. Then I would have some open conversations with the patient about their pain experience and treatment history. If opioids are necessary, I would proceed with caution, starting at the lowest dose to avoid dependence. I would then revise the treatment plan with the patient periodically, which means like you regularly review it and adjust as needed. So is there, is there a problem with this answer? Can someone tell me? Yes. Ishika, what's the problem with the, with the, with the answer? It's quite mediocre. Okay. Thank you, Shika. Thank you for speaking up. So, I mean, I personally thought it was a good answer. <laughs> but, like, but there's here's nothing the thing. that makes it stand out. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not disagreeing with you. It doesn't stand out. And that's exactly what took me, I guess, a year to reapply to learn. Everyone, you, all, you are all so smart. I mean, to get, everyone is deserving of the seat at the medical school. But you're competing with each other. So if everyone has great, like, you know, answers that make sense, answers that are logical, there's no one really saying like me, like random stuff, right? No one's saying like weird, terrible, red flaggy stuff. Everyone is basically saying similar things. So that's why I'm talking about the difference in a great answer and an extraordinary answer. That's the whole point of the presentation. So maybe the first year I applied, I I'd go to like McMaster, the end of my God at McMaster, and I'd say something like this. And then, you know, a few months go by and I didn't get it and I'd be sad. Well, you know, I gave these great answers. I felt confident on every single answer. I didn't mess up. Well, why didn't I get in? It's because everyone is saying great answers. But now the second year, like I, like I told you, I started making those connections beyond just healthcare. Imagine saying something like this. I could first explore, well, in addition to this, to the original answer, you also mentioned that you could first explore a multidisciplinary approach to treating pain, like physiotherapy, lifestyle modifications, exercise, or diet. I would educate the patient about the risks of opioid use and how we can minimize these risks to build a trusting doctor-patient relationship. Okay, this is actually a CAMED role, like, you know, doctor-patient relationship. Now, imagine you go even further. You make connections to the opioid crisis in the major metropolitan areas in Canada especially in BC. You could talk about like, you know, interesting connections like sickle cell disease and racism. So black individuals are more, you know, prone to having sickle cell disease. Or not prone, it's like this genetic mutation, this um this single nucleotide mutation and it's seen more in black individuals and then, you know, they're misdiagnosed or whatnot. That's a social determinants of health uh issue that you can address there. But then they go to the emergency room and they need pain management. And then physicians might think, oh, look at this teenager. He's just looking or she's just looking for drugs. Right. So there's a whole lot of uh, studies that have been done in like racism and opioid use, especially with connection to sickle cell disease. You could discuss specific medical cases relevant to Canada or British Columbia. You could briefly talk about the science of opioid addiction. You know, opioids work on this receptor. You can mention your knowledge of naloxone training. You could talk about maybe maybe you've done street medicine uh, programs where you've been on the street with homeless individuals and you've, you've administered naloxone or, or you have knowledge about that area. It took me really the difference was between the first year and applying the second year. Becoming much more knowledgeable in all these topics so I could put these in my answer. So I'm not just answering the question, but I'm giving my interviewer more. I'm giving them more. I'm giving them connections to my life, knowledge that I have about uh, where I'm applying and so on. And all these questions that we're going to use today, they come from our website. It's We have question banks on the medical school interview, Casper and so on. And this is especially coming from the opioid crisis question bank. Uh, and all the answers that I'm showing you, especially with the tips to go beyond and red flags to avoid, are what we offer for every single question of our hundreds of questions. We offer answers, uh, expert explanations. So this is y'all, you're all interviewing and you know, I, this is not meant to be a man, it's just meant to be like a stick figure, but everyone's deserving again, but only, you know, a certain percent of individuals are going to get that acceptance offer. And you're graded on something like a Likert scale where it might be one to five, it might not be, but with the MMIs, you're given a score. 
And most often, people are getting, like, you know, a good score. If it was out of 10, it's like a 7. 7.5, 8, 7. But if everyone's in that score, you need to be, you need to start distancing yourself from the pack in order to be the person who gets the offer. And this is what I realized in my second year of playing, where I got nine interviews and I got into several medical schools, is everyone is doing the same stuff. Everyone is reading the same books. They're reading books, can you believe it? I never read a single book uh, to prepare for my interviews, but a lot of people read Doing Right. So everyone's doing, everyone's reading this book. I'm not saying it's a bad book. I actually, I've never read it. Uh, everyone is listening to the same podcasts. You might, you must have heard them, like Black, White Coat, Black Art, uh, the C-Madge podcast. Again, I've never listened to these podcasts. I'm not even saying they're bad. They might be very good. But if everyone's doing the same thing, how am I going to stand out? Meanwhile, here's me. And this is like, you know, everyone's doing the same thing. Everyone's pushing this block. But what am I doing here? I spent a year learning about things like AI and medicine. How is AI changing, you know, electronic health records? Because it's, it's literally changing everything from diagnosis to treatment of uh, individuals. I started learning about like financial topics, technology topics, you know, learning the health systems of different countries or the system that they use in Japan or Singapore. A lot of people love Singapore, but it's a very small place. Anyways, I could ramble on, but I started learning about like these different topics. And that's why I urge you to look at this list that I made uh, and expand on it. Because the whole point is you want to stand out with your answers uh, exactly like uh, Ishika said earlier on in this presentation. And this is like the cheat sheet. This is maybe the most important slide in the presentation. And again, I'm going to send you these slides. But there are, these are the five ways I discovered I'm going to stand out with, uh, among other people. I'm going to either address more perspectives than others, right? You demonstrate your knowledge, you demonstrate knowledge about BC or, or so on, so forth. You offer more creative solutions. Right, so maybe for the opioid crisis epidemic, you could talk about, you can, you know, maybe BC can create this, can work on like an online monitoring system of opioid use among providers uh, for stewardship. In fact, I'm sure they have a system like that, right? So that would that would just demonstrate your knowledge. You could be a better speaker. A lot of you, a lot of y'all are incredibly smart, but you need to be personable. And I'm not saying you you aren't, but you need to make sure. In order to make your answers count and your thoughts, your amazing thoughts count, you need to be personable. Crack a few jokes. You know, use your don't use your hands too much. But don't say ums and ahs. Um, uh, right? And look at the camera and speak with confidence. I guarantee you, I mean, you can look at the way I'm speaking, all right? I'm not the best speaker in the world, but I look at the camera and I speak with confidence. And I could be talking about, like, something super random that I have no knowledge about, like giraffes. And if I told you right now, like that the neck of a giraffe on average is 15 feet, you believe me, but I made that up. I have no clue how long the neck of a giraffe is. You make connections to your personal life. So this is a big one. And this is something I would do nearly for every single MMI, if not for every single MMI that I've ever done. Connections to my personal life. So example for, like I said, with that opioid crisis uh, situation, maybe your connection is you've done some street medicine program where you have maybe naloxone training and you've seen the opioid crisis firsthand, okay? Or maybe you've done research in the area. To your future career, a lot of a lot of questions might revolve around collaboration. And I would always say something like, you know, in my future career as a physician, I'm going to be working on in multidisciplinary teams, providing team-based care to patients to provide holistic care, okay? And this is like, it would just demonstrate your maturity that you've thought of how these skills you're talking about relate to your future profession. And you can demonstrate specific domain knowledge, like maybe a policy is going on in British Columbia or so on, or in Canada. And always explain why. I know people who will just say the coolest idea is we should build a mobile app. We should have a hotline for this. We should have X, Y, Z cool ideas, but they never explain why. Why should we, you know, have a mobile app instead of just putting in a newspaper or so on. And, you know, everyone knows a smart aleck, all right? You know, he's saying like, these people that just say like random things and, but they say it in a way that like, they're trying to, they're trying to sound smart, you know? 
these individuals, believe it or not, they do get far in these interviews because they can look at a camera and speak with confidence. So, I mean, no offense to this guy. I don't know him. But make sure, that's why I bolded this. Look at the camera and speak with confidence. And the only way you can do that is by recording yourself, timing yourself, and reviewing the videos. Maybe even sending it off to friends and family to see what you could improve, okay? Because I want everyone to succeed. You're on Zoom, right? You're not in person, so make sure you succeed there. Now, should you speak for the full time? So this is a synchronous interview. So the answer is no. So for example, McMaster's interview is synchronous. So is UBC's. Uh, for, well, for the first part, the three minutes, I would try to fill that up because it, it's structured like that. But when, when you're at the follow-up phase, you don't want to be rambling because they're humans too. They've seen the same person give the same answer 10 times. So either you need to start saying some very interesting stuff very soon or keep it succinct so they can keep asking you more questions. And in fact, they kind of want to help you. That's in my personal experience, they want to help you. They will, if you're missing something in your answer, they will ask you about it. But if you're rambling for the whole time, they can't ask you about it. And should you even go in depth or broad? So if there's like something you want to talk about, should you talk about one thing in depth or like several things broadly? And my general principle is I discuss one or two ideas deeply, but I always acknowledge other viewpoints at the end or before I even start. So if I can make that more clear, let me know. Can we, I'm going to go to the next question. Does anybody have any questions before I start? <clears throat> All right, let's do this question together. What role do you think housing policies play in the overall health outcomes of homeless individuals in BC? So these are the sort of BC specific topics that you could be, you could be asked in your interviews. Not this exact question, obviously. I don't run those interviews, but you could be expected to know something about this. And let's look at this answer. I'm not going to read the whole thing. All right. Let's skip this main idea part, but let's see what this individual says. So there's an introduction here. I'm going to skip it. Okay. Let's start with the green. So in discussing the role that housing policies play in the overall health outcomes of homeless individuals in BC, this individual says the BC's government, the BC government's collaborative plan belonging in BC is designed to prevent and reduce homelessness through outreach programs, grants, partnerships, and so forth. The comprehensive approach is vital because homelessness is a significant issue with an average of, you know, 12,000 people experiencing homelessness each month in 2021, which is the most recent statistics. And there's been $200 million uh, provide, uh, you know, the provision of more than $203 million for emergency shelters subsidized units and rent supplements further underscores a commitment that BC has to support individuals who are at homeless or at risk. And then the individual starts saying that the link between homelessness and health outcomes cannot be overstated. So not only are they talking about homelessness, but now they're, they're tying it to the full extent of the question, health outcomes. They talk about how individuals experiencing homelessness face higher levels of, this, of disease, mental health issues, and substance abuse disorders. And they go into some statistics over there. And lastly, they get innovative on us, okay? A novel approach in BC is an introduction of complex care housing, which specifically targets people with overlapping mental health challenges, substance use issues, and acquired brain injuries. The policy acknowledges, acknowledges that a one-size-fits-all approach is ineffective. Different subsets of the homeless population have different needs, and housing policies must be tailored to meet these needs. And then there's a, there's a conclusion. So let's see what this individual did right, okay? They demonstrate a very high level understanding of BC policies. And this is like one of the basic things you can be expected to understand about BC, like the homelessness crisis. They understand the social determinants of health affecting homeless populations. And they have innovative ideas. Not only, like these, these two paragraphs right here, all right, the second and third, these answer this question phenomenally eight, nine out of 10. But now we have innovative ideas added on, right? Complex care housing. And let's look at other ideas that, that are provided. You could suggest partnerships with local health authorities for integrated healthcare services in the support of housing. You could propose policy advocacy for the inclusion of mental health and addiction recovery programs within the housing initiatives. So all these cool ideas will not only help you give your expert answer, but to stand 
go far beyond where anybody else has gone in giving their answer. So this, this interviewer who's heard the same answer 20 times in the same day, they're like, wow, not only is this just the best like answer addressing the question I just gave, but it's also it also goes beyond in ways nobody else has. And that is the name of the game. You can only gain that by spending a lot of time studying and a lot of time practicing the delivery of your thoughts and the organization of your thoughts, okay? Oh, does that make sense? Please stop me if it doesn't. And I'm going to talk about uh, the last section, first impressions and personal questions. I promise you, um, this is a quick presentation. So first impressions matter, obviously. Something I would do is during that reading period, I would rehearse the first thought that would come out of my mouth, the first sentence. And it's a synchronous interview. So always introduce yourself and ask for their name. I always do that. Hello, hi, my name is Kevin. With whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? Oh, my name is Dr. Abbas. Okay. Dr. Abbas, thank you for taking time out of your Monday evening to, to interview me. And then I'll get I'll get on with my response. Now, you could be asked personal questions as well. Okay. So, for example, what is the biggest challenge that you've overcome? And these are always tied in, and, and especially with the follow-ups, because the follow-ups might be about you in, in your interview format. The follow-ups might be these personal questions like name a time. You, like name a time you did something that is not related to school or medicine. Like, what do you do as a hobby? I've been asked that in interviews. You could look at the CanMed roles, and I would have a story or two or three for every single CanMed role, okay? You want to have these stories that are very versatile, and they will match different types of questions that could be asked. This is another list of, uh, this is the one I used when preparing, even for Canada, Canadian and US medical schools. Uh, communication, you know, problem solving. So I would have stories for each of these pillars. And a lot of times, you know, the story that you're going to use for your biggest challenge you overcome, it could hit resilience, it could hit overcoming conflict, it could hit capacity for improvement, maybe even problem solving, it could hit a lot of them, communication. So that's what I mean by having versatile stories. And to answer the, these sort of questions, you want to use something called the STAR method. You talk about the situation you were in, your responsibility, the action you took, and the result. You don't want to leave them on a cliffhanger. You want to let them know what happened. So last semester, let's let's go an example. Last semester in the McMaster Biology Society, while organizing a programming skills workshop for first year students, we encountered an unexpected vendor cancellation, leaving us without crucial materials. I was tasked with swiftly finding a replacement vendor without overshooting our budget. S and T, you want to get these over with quickly, put them in the scene very quickly because you don't get any points. You don't get any points if you said, I was at, you know, the premier, or like the, I was in the prime minister's office and I was tasked with this. They don't care. Get s &T over with immediately. And, and that's the thing. For me, the first year uh, I was interviewing, I'd had these detailed stories because, you know, these are meaningful stories in your life. I was there and the professor was doing this. However, the last day this happened, and, you know, my, my shoe was untied. And, whatever, right? I would have, and I would spend maybe, if I had like three minutes to talk, I'd spend like a minute and a half just like saying the situation. But they don't care. They've heard a hundred random situations all day. Where you get your points is in the action and the result. So let's read this now. Consequently, I quickly researched alternative suppliers, assessed their offerings against our needs, and strategically approached the most promising ones to renegotiate terms suitable for our budget. So here we're, we're showing the skills we're using, okay? I use strategies like calling suppliers instead of email to ensure rapid communication. Ultimately, we secured the necessary materials under budget and the workshop went on without a hitch, earning praise from attendees. Very cool, very clean, you answer the question. However, and I think I invented this, okay? I, if y'all have heard of the T, I think the star method is missing a T. And I'll tell you what it means. But if y'all have heard of this, let me know, because I actually think I invented this. There's a missing T in this method, and it's called the takeaway. What was your takeaway? And generally, I do like a personal story or a relation to my future profession. That Those are the two I'd go to, and it'll often make sense which one you use. So let's see what the takeaway could be for the story. 
as I pursue a career in medicine, I will continue to draw on such skills to stay collected in rapidly changing situations. Through strong communication skills, along with problem solving, I will continue to ensure team needs are met for the benefit of my future patients. This is like, wow, not only did this applicant, this interviewee, give me a very solid answer to the question. I mean, who didn't? The last 10 people did. But they just showed their maturity. They just they just showed they thought about their future profession with this very, very cool connection. All right. And generally, this is what I try to do. So I'd have a bunch of stories ready for all of these different categories. And my stories would reflect my values, which are often related to the CanMeds items. Sometimes, a lot of the times, they have a connection to my future career. How does a story relate to my future career skills that I would use as a future physician. And sometimes, and I would try to do this, I would research the heck out of the medical school I was interviewing at, and I would make a connection to the medical school, right? So I don't know, I don't know about, for example, I was in the US and I could say, oh, okay, okay let, me, let me rephrase. A lot of Americans do this because they apply to 30 medical schools and they get into like 10. All right, the American citizens. So the medical schools want to know why, well, why do you want to go here? Why should we accept you? I don't think you're going to actually apply. And it makes them look bad if they accept a bunch of people that don't go. So Americans, they do practice reading up on the medical school and trying to understand, you know, what's special about the medical school and integrating that into their answers. Canadians don't do it as much because there's so few medical schools that you're like, you know, you're lucky to even get into one. So you don't care which one you go to really. But I would, you know, I would talk if I was interviewing at like, like McGill or something or, or Ottawa or Queens, wherever I interviewed at, if I could, you know, oh, McGill has this comprehensive cancer research center where you're doing research on XYZ. And a lot of my, you know, experiences are relevant to that. Or, okay, let's go back to the opioid crisis question, right? Maybe, maybe UBC has this like public health department that is integrated with the medical school. And they offer programs to learn about things like the opioid crisis, or maybe they have, you know, maybe they have like global health programs where you go to different countries and, and you, you provide care over there. You can read up on UBC, read about all everything they offer, go to the forums, see what students are saying about what this place offers, and see where your stories, you can tie those into to make it very, very personalized. Your answer is very personalized to the medical school you're applying to your interviewing gap. So now let's go to the pro tip section. All right. Organization. This is about letting your amazing answers get the recognition they deserve. So in, in the first sentence or two, I would always give in my MIs an outline of what I will talk about. So for example, hello, you know, you introduce yourself, you go through everything. I will begin by addressing the pros and cons of implementing such a public health policy before giving my opinion and then relating it to an experience I have had in the area. This is so beautiful because imagine you're asked about a public health policy and should it be implemented? You're gonna tell, tell your interviewer exactly what to expect. And in the game where like 40% of people are rambling, they're not even organizing their ideas or like midway through like something cool came to their heads and they do a tangent and then they forgot their main point. This is going to get you so far. I have practiced with a lot of people and the best inter interviewees I've seen, they're all people who will tell me at the beginning the structure of what they're going to say. And you have time. You have two minutes to think about it or a minute. Now, recall that first impressions are critical, right? We've been over this. And also, you can consider a summary statement at the end. Not always necessary. Obviously, avoid extreme stances. So this sounds obvious, but it's really not. For example, if you're asked, like, should pharmaceutical companies be allowed to provide gifts, right? You might be inclined to say no, like, oh, that's, you know, that's a conflict of interest, blah, blah, blah. Well, true, but what if they're giving you samples of the drug that is actually beneficial to some of your patients and your patients can't afford those drugs? Because obviously, BC and Canada, they don't have pharmacare. They don't offer free medications. It's only, you know, Medicare. Well, see, there are these nuances. And that pharmaceutical company, well, it hires people. And those people have families to feed, right? So even if you don't like, like a certain party in the question, always acknowledge some of their basic viewpoints, okay? 
that's going to really help you stand out compared to everyone else who just jumps to the most like you know the most feel good answer uh and avoid politics where possible here's another thing when i was a kid i read this book and it was called the seven habits of highly effective teens it told me to to do like to imagine things or do things right before i slept and it would say the stuff you do like 45 minutes before you go to bed is replayed in your head six times more than everything else you did in that day now i don't know how true that is that number but i do believe it it's why when you study the night before an exam and then exams in the morning you don't do that bad or if you watch like a horror movie you're gonna have like right before you sleep you're gonna have nightmares right or you're like you're seeing the news and there's like murders or whatever you're gonna have bad sleep so i would do a lot of my studying at night right before i slept so i would i would have that mmi perspective taking mindset ingrained in my brain it would just kept it would be like the last thing i did in the day and my, my brain would replay it also i would make use of my time right you're you're, you're pre-med students you don't have a lot of time i would listen to podcasts in the gym and i wouldn't listen to the same podcasts as everybody else i would listen to podcasts not only on healthcare but on economics finance technology getting a mix of viewpoints which you know paid immense dividends when i started interviewing and helped me get into top schools like the mayo clinic here in the united states or mcmaster in canada zoom out so this is something like a lot of the time sometimes the question can be cut off especially on your 13 inch screen this is like a small tip i would put my zoom at like 90 percent so share your videos share videos of your answers with colleagues and practice with friends so because this is over zoom let me show you what i mean so our platform we have question banks like on the medical school interview and it kind of looks like you world you pick your categories like i want to do some policy questions right now and i'll do a policy test i'll do like 11 questions you can set the timer to whatever you want you can give yourself two minutes to read a few minutes to answer you can completely customize it how do you think the growing problem of antibiotic resistance should be approached this is something you could be asked. And then our platform lets you record yourself. You can give your answer to the camera. Make sure you're looking at the camera. And then our platform. And then you can save your video, review what you said, say what you said, so you can compare your answers over time. And again, we have that same platform where we give you the answer. Well, not the answer, but we give you a model answer with a lot of ideas on how to stand out, right? So for this problem, like how do you think antibody resistance pro? This is one of the free questions you can sign up for our website and you can study the answer. And there's really cool ideas like market incentives that prevent companies from developing new antibiotics. Like there's a lot of cool ideas here for everyone to learn from. And you can just keep going through, you know, different questions. And lastly, practice, 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 okay? You have this list, I'm sending you this list of topics to study, all right? And before uh, we get into the Q&A, I want to show you that we have questions on British Columbia health policy. So like we showed you you can go in here create a test you know the repeated delays in establishing the new simon fraser i think sfu medical school have raised concerns what impact do you think the opening of this new medical school will have on healthcare in bc so this directly talks about you know the doctor shortage there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh questions here like healthcare services aging population uh and so on and so forth you know health disparities among indigenous communities in bc so this is a huge one especially last year, indigenous community questions. And not only do we do BC, but social determinants of health, telehealth, opioid crisis, AI in health, that's a huge one. You could study on other provinces, Manitoba health policy, alternative medicine, and so on and so forth, okay? And we're gonna be giving you a subscription credit along with the slides uh, that we will be sending right after this presentation. So thank you all. Now I will be taking any questions you may have.